In the middle of 2017, there was a compilation playlist on YouTube called Important Videos. This was a compilation of over 300 short videos ranging from 10 seconds to 2 to 3 minutes. They were also from a collection of all sorts of different mediums, like animation, film, old TV, even some like commercials or public broadcast TV shows. You're not even a real journalism. That's right. All coalesced into one big playlist in an easily watchable order. In college, this would be my friend's go-to thing to watch during a party where we're all like drinking and playing Mario Kart. That's right, instead of having someone make a three-hour playlist to DJ, we listen to the dinosaur that goes This generation really lucked out with this playlist, in my opinion. Even just a few years ago, it was pretty difficult to find a video that could reach a wide audience that everyone could appreciate. And before the trend of viral YouTube videos, there were only a few places to go to see some of the really good stuff. Before YouTube, I used to go to, I think it was like funnyjunk.com and ebombs world. Yeah, I think that's where, I think that's what the two sites were. I remember watching Jeff Dunham's Ahmed the Dead Terrorist and thought it was the funniest thing on the face of the earth. But before these two websites, there was somewhere else entirely where you could catch all these funny videos. America's Funniest Home Videos. America's Funniest Home Videos was the original clip show. It first aired on ABC in 1989 and is still running to this day. This clip show would feature a host reacting to short clips, most of which being found on old family home videotapes sent in by viewers. These videos can range from animals doing funny things, babies doing funny things, elderly people doing funny things, or kids pranking each other and getting hurt. An extra layer added to the show in its inception was the host adding additional commentary or sound effects to the videos in question. Picture the cliche cartoon bonk noise or the classic horn. I might even pause for a second to play a couple of my favorites in quick succession. I think later on the show they also tried to introduce a competition feature where clips could win money for being the funniest of the night, but I'm not sure if that was a regular edition or this was just for a short time. The original host of America's Funniest Videos was Bob Saget, more commonly known as Danny Tanner from the Full House franchise. As I was doing research on this, I found out that despite having two of the biggest family shows on television in the 80s and 90s, Bob Saget is one of the dirtiest comedians to grace the stage. That's just something fascinating I thought I'd throw in. There have been many hosts in the many years of the show, each one bringing something different. When I would watch the show growing up, I only ever saw episodes from Bob Saget in reruns or Tom Bergeron when he would host the show regularly. Apparently, Alfonso Ribeiro is the current host, which is good to see Carlton Banks from Fresh Prince getting a working gig. It sucks that right now it happens to be during a pandemic, so there really isn't a live studio audience to laugh with, but it sounds like the kind of luck that Carlton would appreciate. Because America's Funniest Videos has been on the air for so long, there were of course going to be copies of it. Some of these copies at least add to the formula of what's going on and have some inspiration, but others, well, not so much. Now these next two shows I'm going to talk about, Tosh.0 oh and The Soup, have their own set of differences. But I'm going to talk about them at the same time because they're pretty much the same show on paper. Both shows are more satirical and vulgar versions of America's Funniest Videos. They both take clips and react to them to a wide studio audience, more often than not playing the clip in full and doing a post-commentary after the fact. These shows are also shot on a green screen set with a computer-generated background that also employs graphics and the clip in question off to the side as if it was on a news network. The jokes of the hosts build and build until they get a groan from the audience, implying that the joke either went a little bit too far or had run its course. Both shows are hosted by straight white male comedians with a fashion sense that, even though it's better than mine, still implies that they're a more casual show than America's Funniest Videos. Both shows have a multitude of different segments to keep the show fresh, and I think it's in these segments where the shows really shine. The Soup, hosted by Joel McHale, was on the E! Network from 2004 to 2015. The show more often gives comedic takes on pop culture news, like who's dating who, movie and music news, and how a contestant on this season of The Bachelorette is still looking for a bit too young for the guys she's interested in. The Soup also had a collection of characters that would be introduced throughout to add to the improv nature of the show. 
these characters were usually other staff members, like writers or producers or other production people. The suit was cancelled in 2015, but in 2018, Joel McHale was offered by Netflix to host a spiritual successor, known as The Joel McHale Show with Joel McHale. Unfortunately, the show was also cancelled, but this time only after 19 episodes. In the same year, however, I'm pretty sure 13 Reasons Why was greenlit for a fifth season, so I'm gonna keep my comments to myself that Netflix watchers are sometimes the worst people to follow in order to find out what shows should be continued and what shows should be cancelled. Tosh.0 takes a bit more of a similar approach to America's Funniest Videos. Daniel Tosh takes a collection of viral internet clips and reacts to them in the same way Joel McHale did on The Soup watching the video with the audience, waiting for their reactions, and doing a post-commentary monologue. I was a bit more of a Tosh.0 fan because it was available on Comedy Central, and I had no real reason to watch the E! Network when I was in middle school and high school. Tosh.0 is somehow still airing to this day. I don't think I've seen an episode in quite some time, but I think it's just interesting that they're still going on this far along. Tosh.0 had a few special segments that it would implement regularly in its programming. One of these was the viewer video of the week, in which YouTube sketch comedians would send in a video they created, and Tosh would show them, react to them, and give a special shout out to the channel. What really made this segment work was that it started when YouTube viral videos were really starting to kick off, so there was always some new video to make fun of and laugh at. Some of the bigger names of these creators include Wheezy Waiter, Funny or Die, The Fine Brothers, and known piece of shit pedophile Onision. I'm gonna add something that is also not in the script, but I'd like to point out that this was also another segment. Uh, Tosh.0 featured this segment called The Web Redemption, where every episode he would find a viral video that was more often than not someone failing at something, and he would reach out to that person and do like a small documentary style thing about how the video came to be, what they're doing now, and give the creators the option to recreate the video. This way, it's less of a fail and more like they're the ones in charge of whether something is, like, whether something goes wrong or not. I just thought it was really interesting that instead of just making fun of people for what's going on in the video, Tosh gives them a second chance. He's like, everyone deserves a second chance, so I'm gonna let these people play with their Star Wars lightsabers in, with, like, good lighting effects and shit. I don't know, it's just kind of fun. It's important to point out that there are still more clip shows coming out to cable, but I think they're far less interesting than these first two that I mentioned. One of the biggest standouts in the shit department to me is Ridiculousness, which already has a bad start with how cringy the name is. They pretty much use the same clips that you saw in Tosh.0 or The Soup, but instead of making any jokes about it, they would just laugh and recap what happened in the video. The show is hosted by Rob Deerdeck and doesn't really include anything formula changing to make it stand apart from the other shows. What does make it stand out though, as much as I loved his shows on MTV, Deerdeck and crew are probably some of the most obnoxious TV hosts that I've ever seen. One of the co-hosts of the show, Chanel West Coast, is even memed on for having one of the most annoying laughs in television. <laughs> I'm not trying to hate on the show, like, I appreciate what they're doing, like, attain that grain, get that money, but I think this show in particular is just a bit too derivative and doesn't really add anything as interesting to the table. Going back to YouTube, though, that's where the next level of evolution of the clip show came from. Tosh.0 was good, but it was starting to level out a bit in quality and content. This leveling out in quality made it possible for other breakout stars to rise up but since they didn't already have a following in stand-up or traditional acting, they made themselves available on a platform that would accept any video from any kind of artist, YouTube. Now, as meta as it is to make reaction videos on YouTube that mainly features content from YouTube, I think this was an interesting step in the direction. These shows in their heyday felt a bit more genuine, as they're not supported by bigger networks, and we're just kind of winking it. The YouTube algorithm in these days was also a bit different, so they wouldn't get flagged for showing clips that might have been copyrighted. One of the first big ones that came to mind when I think about it was Equals 3. Equals 3, stylized like this, was created and hosted by Ray William Johnson starting in April of 2009. These videos were first created in Johnson's dorm room and then later hosted in an actual studio. 
Equals 3 soon became a partner of Maker Studios, one of YouTube's first multi-channel networks that would pay content creators per view for every video. Over 600 episodes were uploaded to the Equals 3 channel, most of which hosted by Johnson himself. In 2014, Johnson stepped back and a few other hosts took over in his place, but the show was inevitably discontinued in 2016. Johnson now works as an aspiring actor in independent films, as well as also creating viral TikToks utilizing animation as a format. Like its cable counterparts, Equals 3 was separated into 5-minute videos and reacted to a total of, you guessed it, 3 videos. Johnson would watch the videos, make jokes after the fact, replay the videos with live commentary, and make closing remarks. Sometimes he would have these weird replays or dubs or something along those lines to accentuate what he found funny. He would do this for three separate clips, thank the viewers, update on any other projects he had going on, and start working on his next video. One of the things I'll never forget from this channel was the cube transition. I think I would use this on PowerPoint presentations in high school as a joke, and I think they really worked for the vibe of the show. Another certified classic clip show was the React series. The show first began as Kids React in 2010 and was created by Benny and Rafi Fine also known as the Fine Brothers. Kids React was a series in which the brothers would enlist the help of children to react to video games or movie trailers or old technology or something along those lines. Though not always your typical clip show, there was a good amount of variety in what they produced. Eventually, throughout the next few years, the show would also expand to teens react, elders react, adults react, college students react, they probably would have put their React logo on a pack of Siberian Husky sled dogs if PETA let them. And that brings me to their React world controversy. In 2016, the brothers saw so much success in their franchise that they decided to trademark it. However, from the way they put it, they would be trademarking the word React in a YouTube video, meaning any revenue of a smaller Joe Schmo trying to do a reaction video would go to the Fine Brothers instead. I think the original intention was that the Fine Brothers were trying to financially help the smaller creators, but the poor marketing strategy led to so much public discourse that the brothers pulled the plug on the project entirely. All of these React series are still going on today, but what fascinates me is that even from this point, there was another evolution in the formula of the clip show, now called commentary videos. In the year 2020, we're back around full circle with YouTube videos reacting to things, although it's under a new guise. Now dubbed commentary videos, there was a whole collection of new different one-man bands that have come up in the YouTube world due to the work of Bob Saget, Joel McHale, Daniel Tosh, and numerous other stand-up comics beforehand. The Fine Brothers and Ray William Johnson probably had to fight weird uphill battles because consumer video production equipment did not come cheap or easy in their days. They probably shot on the dinkiest camera possible and edited on experimental free software until they had investors backing them up and sending them the cool stuff. But now, with technology advancing as much as it has, and the price decreasing on most entry to intermediate level equipment, it's entirely possible for anyone to become a YouTube reactor or commentary channel. I mean, look at me, I'm using a camera that cost me less than two months rent, an audio recorder that I bought with saved up beer money, and a little LED light that I got as a birthday gift. These are becoming so easily available that anyone can do it. But even then, only the best survive. This generation of YouTube is all about on-camera presence, and some of the greats really bring it. Gus Johnson doesn't do many React videos these days, but with his history in theater and years of making videos, he found his voice and has worked with Comedy Central and other big platforms. Eddie Burback, Drew Gooden, Danny Gonzalez, Curtis Connor, and many of the other greats of this generation all started the same way a dude talking to a camera about something funny they saw on the internet, which in theory is the same way that Bob Saget and the executives at ABC probably saw their ideas for America's Funniest Videos. Now, where do we go from here? Is there some kind of philosophical take to ponder here? Why do audiences love to watch these kind of clip shows? Aren't they capable of finding these clips in their own time and making their own reactions? Are these hosts, these comedians, these reactors, these YouTube commentators, are they using their influence to form a whole generation to match their sense of humor? By making this video and reacting to it myself, have I just created a loop that could go on ad infinitum where there are future videos of people 
reacting to a reaction to a reaction to a reaction of a funny internet video from decades prior. I can't really be the one to say philosophy was never really my strong suit, and it sounds like I'm starting to create a robot breaking paradox. So I'll stop here so that hopefully the robot overlords in the future don't see me as a threat. Thank you for sticking around on this video. I liked that I went into a little more deep thinking on this one. If you have any suggestions for future topics, let me know down in the comments or on Twitter right here. Be sure to like the video and and subscribe for more, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.